Welcome back. This is AWS On Air. My name is Aaron Hunter. I'm a senior technical trainer with AWS Training Certification. And with me, we have my buddy who's on this side. <laughs> I just <laughs> high-fived high you. <laughs> you high-fived your microphone, Kyle. I know. That's what happens when things get in the way. I'm Kyle Dickinson, a senior solution architect specializing in threat detection and incident response. I'm going to just find out different ways to say my title. That just flows off the tongue today. <laughs> and if Kyle's not busy high-fiving his microphone, he's here with us teaching about the newest and greatest of technology. And Sid's here to talk about something that was launched earlier today. Hey, everyone. My name is Sid. I'm product manager on Amazon Filecache, which is what Aaron was talking about hot off the press. As Jeff Barr also mentioned earlier, uh, we launched a new service called Amazon Filecache, which helps customers create a cache in the cloud for the, their data sets that could be stored anywhere. Anywhere? Wow. Anywhere. So anywhere. That, that is really cool. That's right. Uh, That's right. So the data sets could be stored uh, on premises, which is something customers have been asking for us for, for a while. They want to access their data sets that are stored on premises and cache them in the cloud so that they can run their workloads in the cloud using their data sets that are on premises uh, in their data centers, basically. So they don't need to move these data sets to the cloud because they're not quite ready to do that yet, but they can still run these workloads in the cloud using those same data sets. So that, that's one, one place we could store. I'm hearing a lot of opportunities to expedite and also reduce the friction between cutting over from an on-prem migration into AWS. Is that right? That's right. So customers aren't always ready to migrate their workload to the cloud. Um, they will over time, but we're, we're building a solution that they can start using the cloud right now, even before they're ready to migrate these workloads to the cloud. That's really awesome. Uh, so this problem or the problem of having some kind of a migration strategy and migrating massive amounts of data and getting it into uh, AWS with the file cache option, it's solving a lot of the problems, but what other types of problems is it solving for our customers? Yeah, so it's solving a, um, so when I said anywhere, the data could really be anywhere. The data could be on premises. The data could be in a file system in the cloud, like a Amazon FSx file system, for example and they could cache that data set using this cache and, and get the high performance, uh, the, high late, the low latencies, up to hundreds of gigabytes per second of throughput, uh, millions of operations per second of, of speed, of data access speed that they could get by using Amazon File Cache in front of those data sets. So and it sounds like, you know, on the infrastructure, the back end of things, you know, the file is being cached, but to the user experience or like the operator experience, it, it's almost transparent to them. Exactly. The, the cache handles the data movement. The cache handles the linking of the data sets and pulling in data as it's needed by the applications that are using the, the cache. So let's say you're running a, uh, a visual effects rendering application for producing a movie it needs to seek assets. Like it needs to seek textures for a character that's in the, in the film. It needs to seek textures for the objects in the room, like a table or a chair. So it's gonna go and ask for those assets. Assets are not in the cloud yet. File cache goes to, let's say it's on-prem is where the data is. File cache goes on-prem, gets the data, brings it into the cache and then serves it from there at really high speeds to these workloads. Now, is there like a prerequisite for the caching, like something like a, a direct connect or a VPN for file caching to work? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great point. So our customers have um, typically already have these types of connections built to the cloud. It, uh, most commonly, direct connect gives consistent uh, connectivity from the cloud to their on-premises locations. But yeah, this can work with a um, internet connection over VPN as well. Okay. That's really cool. And how much of this is managed by the customer or AWS? So Amazon File Cache is fully managed, which means you know, they can create, our customers can create the cache in a few minutes by clicking a few buttons in the console, as I'm going to do later right now in a demo. Um, it's, it full, it's fully managed. That means we manage the cache software. We manage the cache hardware. Uh, if there's any issues with the hardware, we, we replace it. 
we do it on behalf of the customer. Um, we, we take care of managing all the data movement, as we just talked about, um, and any performance tunings that need to be done to make sure their workload is performing as well as it can, to make sure their compute in the cloud is running as optimally and cost effectively as it can. We do all of that. That sounds so, really cool. And again, a lot of our opportunity fully... where AWS is managing the, the scaling. Um, yeah. So, sorry, could you repeat that, Kyle? No, so it sounds like, um, you know, and I don't want to compare service to service, but it sounds like there's more, another opportunity where when someone is looking to cache or import data, uh, we're handling the uh, the scaling up to help with that import or caching of the data. Yeah, yeah. So let's say a customer is caching data. They're pulling the data into the cache. Cache is filling up. So as the cache fills up, it understands and it cycles out the less recently used data from the cache to make room for more data. So we're managing the capacity on behalf of the customer's workload. That's really cool. And because of the fact that it's fully managed, a customer can just maybe have a couple of clicks in the console or make a, an API call through the CLI or one of our SDKs to get started. Is that right? That's right. That's and exactly. you mentioned a demo. Can you show us how to get started? Demo. 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 Sure. Demo. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me pull it up. So there we have it. So I, I brought you to this page, which is our services main website page. So it's located at awsamazon.com slash file cache. Uh, you can go there and you can really very quickly get started by hitting this or get started button. I love that get started button. Yeah. Um, and so here you're in the console. This is the file cache console. You, you see all the caches that I've created before and you have the option to create a new one. So that's what we're going to do today. And I'll walk you through that. So it's even easier for you to do next time you do it. So step one, we provide some basic details about the cache. So I'm going to name it appropriately. AWS on air. Oh, fine. Maybe it is on cache. Um, I'll give it a size of, so the size has to be, this is the cache storage capacity. This is the capacity of the cache that will be used to store the data. Uh, typically customers size this to match the working set of their workload. Okay. So let's say their working set actively used part of their data that could be anywhere. Are there any like calculators or like reference charts that customers can use to help understand what they should select for storage capacity? So this this really is workload specific. So it depends okay. on um, the customer specific workload. So they can start with a cache that's smaller. And if they feel like the cache is cycling out data too often, then they can go with, let's say a bigger one. So I'll okay. go with a slightly bigger cache with 7.2. And additionally, we also build out a metadata server and the metadata storage capacity is 2.4 terabytes for the cache. So that's on top of this. The throughput capacity is a really interesting part. So it scales as you scale up the cache storage capacity. So the larger your cache, the more storage capacity it has, the, the throughput scales linearly at the rate of 1,000 megabytes per second per terabyte. So if I boosted this up to 12 terabytes, you see the throughput went up. There's a question in the chat saying uh, compressing the cache, or I guess the question is asking, does file cache compress the cache in any way? Uh, we don't do any compression right now. OK. And I'm sorry, are you saying terabyte or tebabyte? Tebabyte, which is. Uh, it's the it's very close to terabytes. Yeah, terabytes, tebibytes. It's base two, I, base ten stuff. It's all math. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> if it's math, I'm running away. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> no, I'm back. No, don't worry. All right, I'll take you to the next step. So, this is the step. So we just set up how much the cache is going to be sized at, what the throughput's going to be, what the storage is going to be. Now we look at the the important network and security pieces. So you define where exactly the cache is going to be created in your AWS cloud environment. So you select the VPC. I'm going to go with the default. Uh, I'm also going to go with the default security group and subnet 
And for those security conscious folks, make sure you know what that security group's permitting. Don't allow it to permit all the internet access yep. to your things. No. Mm -mm. Sorry. It's trusted you, advisor uh, is an amazing thing to check for that as well. But yeah. we're not here for that. We're here no, for file cache. Fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, security is job zero for us at Amazon. So that absolutely resonates. And uh, so we also encrypt the data that's in the cache at rest. So this is where you get to set the encryption key and you can use the default as well. Which I'm just, so is this using, so this is using KMS, not uh, just like a, a service specific uh, encryption key, right? That That's correct. It's using a KMS key. Okay. And if we really oh. wanted to boil down, you know, the difference between a service encryption key and KMS, KMS has a key policy and you could also permit uh, deny and then also do key rotation. Sorry, I'm, I'm new here. What What's KMS? It's keeping my smile. All right, key, keeping yeah. a smile. No, Everyone uh... has smiles. Key management service. So for those who don't know, those who are new here, KMS is key management service. Uh, Sid is showing us how you can use KMS to encrypt your objects at rest. Which is always a good idea. Just FYI. <laughs> always, yeah. Hashtag Everybody. security thought by Kyle. <laughs> also, hashtag we do it by default. There you go. There you go. But with KMS, you have the ability to control the key policy, the grants, and who can encrypt and decrypt using that key. And the same applies for file cache. Is that right? Uh, yeah, you can, you can play with your KMS keys just the same way you normally do. Awesome. Now, so once this demo is done, uh, we're almost done, I'm guessing. Is that right? We're, so we're going to create the cache. So I'll show you this next step, which is around um, adding the data repositories to the cache. This is where you link those data sets that could be anywhere. Um, so let me, I've got a couple file systems that I'm going to link here. OK, and so you're linking NFS file systems. That's like. right. OK. So I just pasted one of them in this um, window here. So this is the address to one of them. This one's based in. DC in the Washington DC area. Okay. I'm also going to provide a DNS IP address here for this file system. Seems smart. That's how the the Amazon File Cache service will resolve this address and know what IP to go to. Okay. And I'll say that this is in DC. I'll click add. It shows up here. And yeah, then, when you say so, it's always a, a good idea to use it like a fully qualified domain name over like a static IP address for the repository path? So you could do either or. Um, okay. So next one, I'm going to actually do the other way around. I'm going to use an IP address. Here we go. And while you're doing that, there's a question in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. Can you load and unload uh, from Amazon S3 directly? And I, I see someone has already, because we have people here helping us with the chat, and they said you can link uh, the cache to an S3 bucket or a prefix and automatically load the contents into the cache and uh, access. Is that right? That's right. So what I'm showing you and what we've been talking about so far is how to link on-premises data sets and NFS data sets. Uh, but you can actually link S3 data sets. Um, on a single cache, you could link either S3 or NFS. So I'm going to go and do NFS for this demo, but you can certainly link S3 buckets or prefixes to the cache by supplying an okay, S3 cool. bucket name here. And protocols are important for our storage friends. So which version of NFS do you support? We support NFS version 3. Awesome. Really good to know, because sometimes they're like, hey, hold on. We only support NFS version 4 or version 2 or whatever versions are out there. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. And so I provided this IP address here instead of the fully qualified domain name. Um, so because the IP address is already there, I don't need to provide a DNS IP address here because okay. we don't need to resolve it. And I'll just mark this as Oregon, which is the second region, the region where this one is based in. And I'm assuming because that's a local IP address, this is in the same subnet or at least has a route to that IP address somewhere through your VPC's configuration? Yeah, yeah. So my okay. VPCs are peered, and that's how Got I it. can access from my Northern Virginia data uh, Northern Virginia AWS region, I can access the Oregon region. Cool. 
All right, so here's a summary of what we're creating in terms of the connections to data sources. I'm gonna click next and you can see a summary of what I'm creating. This is the, the name we're choosing for the cache, the storage capacity, the throughput capacity. This is the metadata storage capacity that I mentioned that we add on to every cache to store the metadata. I like that it highlights what is able to be editable after the configuration or after it's created. Um, so it looks like you're able to modify the security group, which is great uh, yeah. in the cache name, but the other um, configuration items that you have, um, you, you cannot adjust after the creation, which is a nice thing to highlight um, just so there's no surprises um, should you need to increase the storage capacity um, or need to change where the you know cache is as far as VPC goes or KMS key. That's right. That's right. That's correct. You see another recap of what we're linking to the cache and then click create cache. There we have it. And just like that, cache yeah. is created. It's not just like created that, the cache is created. It's it's creating, so it's not done yet. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> through a life cycle. I, I read it's well. It's not right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I it's about eight minutes to get, get there, so I, I won't keep okay. waiting for you, but I'll show you um, that all the network settings that we put in are show, showing up here already. The data repositories that we configured. What's the administration already, tab? The administration tab, actually, I, I'm not skipping it for, you, you oh. can update and set your ma maintenance window for your weekly maintenance here. Okay. Um, so once the cache is created, you'll be able to update this as well. Got it. Um, and then the data repository tab, you'll see the, the links to the data sources we just created, and they're also creating. So the cache is talking to my, my file systems, these NFS file systems, and building these links. Cool. So it's using NFS3 to establish a connection and then start to perform some kind of a synchronization, do some kind of a lookup, and then start storing the content in a cache. Yeah. So the cache is mounting those NFS file systems using the NFS v3 protocol as, as a client. Awesome. And then the customers can use this for their on-prem environment and just mount it directly. That's right. Hey, that's perfect. Cool. Hey, uh, I I actually have a storage background. I'm really excited about this. I, I know say, in the do, trainer do you have world, a hidden past behind you. I there, do. Aaron? I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So S3 is like my favorite uh, service. But I, I got to say, this is a really, really exciting. You can directly connect to your on-prem environment. You can simplify your migration workflows. You can streamline the customer experience. Sid, your team has done some amazing work here, and I'm so excited. I've heard chatter in the trainer community, chatter, chatter in our customer community. That it is just really exciting, and it's only been out for a couple hours. Great That's job. Right. Yeah, and now now I'm just curious as to how this is going to even help drive uh, customers to you know migrate to AWS and not have to worry about what data resides in the AWS or resides on prem until they move it over to AWS. Because I know that was you know prior to coming to AWS myself, that was one of the big barriers of adoption was you know, we need to get all the data over to AWS first before we can move our compute. But now this is solving that problem. That's exactly right. You could move some of your data sets over. Some of your workloads are already in AWS. Others are on-prem and you can string them together using, using file cache. You mentioned it's very common for customers to do this across maybe a direct connect connection as well. So they can use um, some high throughput, uh, what performance links to be able to directly link into AWS. Uh, if they needed to, they could probably order Snowball uh, Edge as well as using file cache to further expedite their overall migration. Oh, I am so excited. There's so many opportunities why, here for why our not, customers. Why, why the Snowball, not the Snow Machine? Uh, that depends on, we're going to need a bigger box. Depends. Giant thumb drive <laughs> on wheels. <laughs> All right, Sid, where can people go to learn more about this if they're just getting started? So if they're just getting started, they can go to the website that I showed earlier, which is, I'll just type it in here. So it's amazon.com slash, there we go. So this is the file cache webpage. You can um, look at the feature set. You can learn about the pricing. You can learn about the frequently asked questions about the product. And then you can also go to the documentation to get it, you know, really dig into it. Yeah, pricing is important for everyone. The FAQs are probably going to answer a lot of the questions that they have. Um, but hey, you know, we really appreciate all the info. This is an amazing demo. 
I know I learned a couple things. NFS mm -hmm. version three, there you go, for your on-prem mounting your file cache and stuff. Uh, Sid, thank you so much for being here. Brian, thanks for interpreting for us. And Kyle, thanks for hosting us here. Um, for all of you who are new, who maybe just tuned in, Sid walked us through uh, Amazon File Cache. It's a brand new service that was launched today. And we'll be right back to wrap everything up. Stay tuned. <laughs>